for UK fintech and cybersecurity business in Southeast Asia. And our particular focus for the next two hours is Vietnam, Malaysia, and Indonesia. I'm Ken Wells at the UK ASEAN Business Council, where our mission is to help UK-based firms trade and invest in Southeast Asia. In this capacity, we're delighted to be partnering with the UK government's Asia Pacific Digital Trade Network, otherwise known as the DTN. The DTN is a joint initiative between digital, culture, media, and sport, and the Department for International Trade. I expect you'll be attending this event today because you recognize just how powerful Southeast Asia's FinTech boom is. There's been immense growth since 2016, and it's set to continue. We've seen the heightened need for tech services during the COVID pandemic, notably in mobile banking and contactless business transactions. And this in turn increases the demand for cybersecurity. So if you're in UK FinTech and cybersecurity, Southeast Asia presents an opportunity for you to develop develop your business and scale up. Be ready today for insights and listen out for some valuable tips for accessing new markets in Vietnam, Malaysia and Indonesia. And for anyone looking to work in Southeast Asia, um, there are opportunities both from the UK looking towards Southeast Asia and for companies in Southeast Asia wanting to partner with British firms. In a moment, I'll hand over to Emily Hamblin, Consul General in Ho Chi Minh City and Country Director for Vietnam at the Department for International Trade. Just a couple of notes to highlight before we begin. First, we would love to hear from you during the event, so please do use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to type your questions. Emily will be making sure that they go to the right speaker. Second, I'm glad to say that all the slides presented today will be shared after the webinar, together with a point of contact. Oh, and oh, one more thing. If you're on social media, do tag us. And now to chair today's event, I'm delighted to hand over to Emily Hamblin. Emily, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. Uh, for that wonderful introduction from you and colleagues at UKABC. And a very warm welcome and good morning to our participants who are joining us from the UK and good afternoon to all of those who are joining us in Vietnam, in Malaysia and in Indonesia. As Ken said, I'm Emily Hamblin, Director of International Trade and the UK's Consul General here in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. And I'm delighted to be your MC and moderator for today's webinar, where I think we can look forward to finding out more about the considerable opportunities in both fintech and cybersecurity in Vietnam, Malaysia and Indonesia. So firstly, to just start us off with a reminder of our agenda for today, we'll be kicking off in just a minute with some opening remarks from Mr. Christopher Bush the Regional Director of the UK Asia Pacific Digital Trade Network. And that will be followed by keynote messages from Deputy Governor Sugeng of the Bank of Indonesia, Miss Karen Pua, the President of the FinTech Association in Malaysia, and Mr. Vo Tan Long, the CEO of PwC Consulting in Vietnam. And after these, I'm sure insightful speakers have set the context for us, We'll be diving into a panel discussion on financial inclusion and digital transformation and opportunities in fintech and cybersecurity in the three countries we're focused on today. So I'm really looking forward to hearing from those excellent panelists from UK companies as part of that session. So we've got lined up for you representatives from WISE, from Onfido, from BAE Systems, and from Dark Trace. And just to echo Ken, please do join in with that discussion by posting any questions that you would like to see put to the panelists in the Q&A box at the bottom. And I will uh, do my best to draw on those during the panel discussion. 
But without further ado, let's get started. So I'm very pleased to welcome Regional Director of the UK Asia Pacific Digital Trade Network, Chris Bush. So Chris, over to you. Thank you, Emily, and thank you, Ken, uh, as well. Uh, so good afternoon to all our distinguished guests joining us uh, from Indonesia, Malaysia and Vietnam, and uh, to attendees from, who are joining us from across Southeast Asia. Uh, and good morning to everybody from the UK. Hope everyone is enjoying London Tech Week so far. It, uh, it sounds like it's been a pretty exciting week and uh, still two more days to go. Um, so as Emily said, I'm Chris Bush. I head up the, the Digital Trade Network uh, in Asia Pacific based here in Singapore. Uh, it's really great to be here today to open this session focused on fintech and cybersecurity op opportunities in these really exciting and thriving markets. And uh, thank you, I should say as well, to, to uh, UK ABC for facilitating this session uh, with DIT. And as Emily says, uh, we really appreciate uh, our distinguished keynote speakers joining us today, uh, Deputy Governor uh, uh, Sugun, uh, Ms. Karen Pua, uh, and Mr. Votan Long. So thank you again for, for joining us. Really looking forward to hearing your presentations. So to set the scene, um, I just wanted to mention uh, two major patterns which have really uh, driven this event today and why we thought this would be a great session to talk about uh, during London Tech Week. Uh, the first is that, um, as, as Ken mentioned, Southeast Asia is really experiencing an immense fintech boom. This began before COVID uh, hit the world, uh, but as in many other areas, the pandemic has really escalated, you know, a shift to digitalization and to a cashless world, uh, you know, with a massively, you know, unprecedented growth in demand for mobile banking, contactless transactions, and e-payments across the region. Uh, so it was a really, really exciting opportunity that, uh, you know, that's come out of um, uh, the, the way that we've had to adapt. Um, the second is that parallel to this increase in demand, um, there's a real need for really robust cybersecurity uh, solutions as millions of citizens have gone online for everyday essential tasks for the first time. I know from my own bitter experience with my parents, the amount of times they're exposed to phishing, vishing, smishing, and all kinds of things that uh, they need as much help as they can get in ensuring that uh, they stay protected online. Um, so yeah, so these monumental uh, shifts really come with plenty of challenges, but uh, great opportunities for new partnerships between the UK and Indonesia, Malaysia and Vietnam across FinTech and cybersecurity. And it just really couldn't be a better time to explore these new partnerships between the UK and Southeast Asia. Um, I'm sure some of you will be aware the UK is the newest ASEAN dialogue partner. That's the Association of Southeast Asia Nations. And earlier this month, uh, we launched our new ASEAN UK Digital Innovation Partnership, which is designed to build a long term relationship between the UK and Southeast Asia involving governments and businesses on digital tech. And on top of all that, we have uh, our, our digital trade network, which is already embedded across the region. We've got digital tech experts engaging with governments and tech businesses uh, in the UK and across Asia Pacific to try and enhance digital trade, lower market access barriers, and really just to highlight the opportunities um, uh, available uh, between the UK and uh, Southeast Asia. And um, it's, it's when you look at the last decade, de decade we've already seen trade growth uh, between UK and ASEAN of almost 70% to over 40 billion pounds. And that was before we had these new partnerships in place. So it's really exciting to think of the potential of what we're, what we're gonna see in the future, um, uh, it, you know, between the UK and ASEAN. So um, in addition to uh, our keynote speakers, which we mentioned earlier, um, as Emily uh, said, we've got a really great panel who can talk about their own experiences and expanding to the region give a flavor of the UK's thriving tech ecosystem, uh, which includes our world leading fintech sector and uh, some uh, excellent cybersecurity solutions, which are already protecting millions of people and businesses across the world. So thank you to WISE, uh, BAE Systems, Onfido, Darktrace, uh, all great representatives of the UK's expertise. I'm really looking forward to hearing uh, your experiences and your tips. And um, yeah, so with all that said, I would just like to say a huge thanks once again to UK ABC, to our keynote speakers and panelists who are taking their time to share their insights. And uh, particularly thank you to everybody who has tuned in today uh, to, to, to this session. 
Uh, please do engage, use the chat function, ask questions uh, to uh, help ensure we all make the most of this opportunity. And yeah, hope you enjoy the session. So thank you very much. And I will hand back over to Emily. Thank you, Emily. Thank you very much, Chris. Um, I think, yeah, it's really exciting. As you say, you've highlighted those those two patterns, those two trends of the, the fintech boom that's happening in Southeast Asia and has only been accelerated by adapting to the COVID-19 situations. And then going with that, the increasing need for cybersecurity and taken together just the huge opportunities for partnership, um, both at government level, but also for business opportunities that that all presents. So really excited to hear more about all of that today. Um, next, I'm very delighted to be able to welcome Deputy Governor Sugeng from the Bank of Indonesia to give a perspective from Indonesia. So thank you very much, Mr. Sugeng, and over to you. Mr. Sukeng, I can't yet hear you. Yes, I can open the camera. Uh, I can hear you loud and clear now, so that's great. And we can now see you as well. Perfect. Over to you. Okay, thanks. Honorable Chair Gar, UK Abang Digital Trade Department for International Trade, Mr. Chris Bass, distinguished speaker, distinguished panelists, and participants, ladies and gentlemen. Very good morning and very good afternoon to all of you. It is great pleasure for me to join this London Tech Week 2021-04. Today, in this particular webinar, we will mainly discuss about fintech and cybersecurity opportunities in Southeast Asia, especially in Indonesia, Malaysia, and Vietnam. To begin my remark, please allow me to present our point of view in Bank Indonesia as a payment system regulator regarding fintechs and cybersecurity opportunities in Indonesia. As we all know, the COVID-19 pandemic had altered the way we live, fought contactless communication and physical distancing approach. In this challenging condition, surely we still want economic activity to keep on going while adapting COVID-19 protocol. Against this big group, digitalization is essential. Distinguished speaker, ladies and gentlemen, Looking at Indonesia, digital economy and financial activity are proliferating in line with the greater use of digital platform and instruments, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic. E-commerce uh, e transaction in Indonesia grew 74% in August 2021, it is annual growth, higher than uh, nine, uh, in 2019 before pandemic, which is only uh, six, uh, 20 of our uh, siphon. And looking at digital banking was growing sharply in 2021, 58%. Uh, uh, sharp increase compared with uh, only 4% before the pandemic. And while if you uh, look at the electronic money, uh, still growing at uh, the first uh, pace, uh, 40, uh, 43%. Last year is uh, uh, more than 100%. However, in line with this massive use of digital technology, we know that digital decisions are also vulnerable to cyber attack. According to Kasper Sky Security Statistics, Indonesia is among the most 10 countries attacked by mobile malware, malware in 2001. That is why we in Bank Indonesia put a lot of attention to address cyber threat risks, especially in payment system area. A blessing for us in Indonesia, especially Bank Indonesia, long before the COVID-19 pandemic, to be precisely in early 2019, Bank Indonesia launched the Payment System Blueprint 2025, which aimed at integrating the national digital economy and finance. The blueprint consists of five visions. The first, the integration of national digitalization 
uh, digital economy and finance in ensuring the proper functioning of central bank mandate. The second, digital transformation within banking industry to sustain bank role as in the primary institution in the digital economy. The third, interlink between fintech and bank to contain the escalation of shadow banking risk. And the fourth, the balance among innovation, customer protection, integration, uh, sorry, integrity and stability as well as fair competition. Uh, in this area, we also include uh, how our effort to mitigate the cyber risk. And the fifth, safeguard national interest on cross-border use of digital economy and finance. This vision play a big role fostering digital transformation in Indonesia's economy and finance ecosystem, as well as mitigating the risk that may emerge, especially in the pandemic situation. Distinguished speaker, ladies and gentlemen, the implementation state of Indonesia payment system vision 2025 is cascading into five initiatives. The first initiative is facilitating the interlink between bank and fintech. This initiative will be achieved through the open API standardization. The second initiative is strengthening the retail payment system. This initiative will be achieved through the development of BI fast infrastructure that support the availability of 24 hours, seven day service, real time, seamless and secure payment service. We are planning to operate BI fast effectively in December this year. The third initiative is strengthening the financial market infrastructure. This initiative will be achieved through modernizing the infrastructure and strengthening the regulatory framework of FMI. The fourth initiative is developing public infrastructure for data. This initiative will be achieved through the provision of payment data hub and digital payment ID. And the last but not least, we will also reform our regulatory licensing and supervisory approach. In this area, we will also introduce the cyber resilience a guidance for Indonesia's payment system industry so that we could nurture digital innovation as well as mitigating risk, especially cyber risk. In this opportunity, I would like to elaborate more about several initiatives that we have, which is in line with our topic discussion today. First, QR code Indonesia standard, or we call it CRIS in short, that was launched in August 2019, just before the pandemic. The implementation of CRIS is part of initiative in strengthening the retail payment system. The use of CRIS gives us to advantage at least. CRIS is a game changer in Indonesia's digital economy system. It could increase not only financial inclusion, but also economic inclusion. CRIS had digitally transformed MSME and traditional market, making making them accustomed to accept non-cash payment, thereby expanding their customer base and increase share. This is in line with the spirit of economic inclusion. MFSME and traditional market play will also uh, gain access to bank account for increased settlement purpose. This uh, support financial inclusion, of course. Until now, more than 10.4 million MSME and traditional market traditional merchant had gone digital. Moreover, we are targeting around uh, 12 million Chris merchant by the end of this year. We view that Chris is very useful in giving room for economic activity to keep on going. When all economic activities should be carried out with physical distancing protocol, Chris had become the answer. It has a non-face-to-face -face model so that we could conduct the payment for goods and services repeatedly by receiving the QR code via chat or message app, such as WhatsApp, and then upload it to payment app to complete the payment transaction. By using this, Indonesian people could buy food, vegetable in the traditional market, make a donation or charity via most of our church, as well as paying tech to government easily, safely, and conveniently. The latest innovation from Chris is QR cross-border link 
kids between Indonesia and, and Thailand. Through this collaboration, users from Indonesia are now able to use their mobile payment app to scan the QR code to make payment to merchants all over Thailand and of, of vice versa. Once international travel resumes, we feel that tourists will be the key sector that will uh, greatly benefit from the service to do the large number of tourist flows between those two countries. But tomorrow, we are planning to expand the uh, QR collaboration, QR collaboration with Malaysia as well as other countries in Southeast Asia. The second initiative that I would like to elaborate today is API standardization. In August this year, Bank Indonesia launched the National Open API Payment Standard, or we call it SNAP. SNAP implementation is a critical place to accelerate open banking. Application of national standard is expected to, to promote integration, interconnectivity, and interoperability between bank and fintech. Consistent with, uh, with practices in several other countries, Open API payment standardization is expected to reduce industry fragmentation and simultaneously accelerate financial and economic digitalization. Currently, SNAP is comprising protocols and instruction to facilitate inter application interconnectivity in terms of payment transaction processing. Moving ahead, we will also eager to develop API standardization together with industry and Indonesia's FSA in the area of digital lending so that it could boost economic growth faster. Along with the ongoing digitalization, we have to be aware that the cyber risk need to be addressed properly. Thus, in our vision, we also set framework to increase cyber resilience. As part of this framework, we have built domestic cyber security uh, sharing platform. We call it CSSP, with more than 100 banks member and will be expected to include non-bank institutions in the exposure of non-bank in this digital area continue to increase. The CSSP serves as a, a forum for information sharing about cyber uh, attack trends, especially that had already occurred in Indonesia. In international refer, we have joined re regional and global initiative on cyber resilience, such as ASEAN CRIPS and FS ISAC. We are also complying with international cyber guidance set by the CDMA. This English speaker, ladies and gentlemen, before closing my speech, I would like to add some information regarding the upcoming Indonesia G20 presidency. In 2022, Indonesia G20 presidency will work with G20 members and international organizations to support economic recovery and promote the overarching objective of strong, sustainable, balanced, and inclusive growth through five strategy areas, namely promoting productivity, increasing resilience and stability, ensuring stability and inclusive growth, enabling environment and participation, and strengthening collective global leadership. In this regard, digitalization is in indispensable and enable element to achieve those strategy area, especially to enhance productivity, support digitalization in the economy, develop efficient and reliable cross-border payment, develop a robust framework for central bank digital currency, and promote financial inclusion. With this, I stop my speech here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Deputy Governor, for that really helpful overview of the situation in Indonesia. And I think it came across really clearly both the growing demand for areas like digital banking, e-commerce, electronic money, and relatedly, cybersecurity. But equally, just how much the authorities in Indonesia are, are doing to actively support the development of these markets. So that's really um, very helpful. Thank you. Next on our, gen our agenda, um, I would like to welcome the president of the FinTech Association in Malaysia, Ms. Karen Pua. 
for her keynote speech. So thank you very much, uh, Ms. Pua, and over to you. Thank you so much, Emily. Thank you to the organizer for inviting me today. I am uh, Karen Pua from the FinTech Association of Malaysia. Um, I would love to be doing this in London, but equally grateful that we are still able to connect virtually. Congratulations to the organizer for a successful event. A couple of days ago, our finance minister, YB Tengku Zapro, delivered the opening remark at the Malaysian Banking and Finance Summit. And he spoke about the coordinated approach towards ensuring progress in our economy and society at large. He called it the three R, i.e. Uh, resilience, recovery, and reform, and are directed to the financial institutions. So fintech companies will be the fourth R, which is ready. So for many years, fintech companies around the world has been pushing new innovations and products. And kudos to the thousands of fintech companies for continuously surprising us with their ingenuity. Malaysia's fintech journey started in October 2016 with the launch of the regulatory sandbox framework. While we may not have a clear idea of where we were going in the beginning, we knew that this is an exciting sector and we should get it right. Malaysia is an optimum sized country with uh, 32.6 million people, despite our relatively small size compared to our neighbors like uh, Indonesia and Vietnam. We are compact and concentrated with a lot of cities sprawled across the peninsula. These cities are all within reach of less than one hour if you fly and traveling by car from the North Point to the South Point will take less than 10 hours. So we are an advanced country, digitalized and has world-class technology and infrastructure. This country with 20.2 uh, million smartphone users make us a suitable market for any FinTech innovations. Our market size has unmet needs and digitizing the sectors is a mandate by our government and will give us more extensive customer base welcomed by fintech and investors. And in a way, opportunities bring new horizons when we define what fintech stands for in Malaysia. We expanded the definition saying that uh, wherever we can digitize, whether for the bank, serving the customer or the SMEs trying to get into financial services or a time to adopt financial services, anything can help to move the narrative for us. So that led to the birth of uh, the FinTech Association in Malaysia. Today, we serve close to 300 FinTech companies, over 1.15 million SMEs, and that represents over 97% of total business establishment. And as a bridge for the companies, making us the national business-to-business -business FinTech platform. We work with the Malaysian government agencies to create collaborative spaces and opportunities for fintech companies to create meaningful solutions. And with more than 32.6 million people and 95% bank population, this combination is ideal for any fintech companies to start in Malaysia. Malaysia has been the hub to many tech companies, the likes of Avenger from Germany, Dell, HP, Intel, and IBM since the 80s. Our large pool of tech talent is the beginning for us to build our human capital. Without the underlying human resource, we cannot get into fintech as we need to increase those capacities and capabilities. So we put a lot of effort into building that human capital. Today, we have 10,000 plus jobs created in this fintech sector. For regulators and for regulators in Malaysia, we have two. Uh, the Central Bank of Malaysia and the Securities Commission. And they are always open to engage with the industry, uh, with the association. We have held many roundtable discussions to find a way to fine tune the regulations. It may not be to change the policy, but at least we get the regulators to understand the changes within the industry and what the players are facing. We gather all the necessary regulations and those that needs to be relooked and we may need to have to take into consideration what is already available. So for this, our Central Bank of Malaysia launched the regulatory sandbox to give FinTech innovators to test their innovations. We are progressive uh, when it comes to the whole idea of collaborating from day one. 
the success behind this comes from a very expensive and extensive collaboration. Our relationship with multilateral agencies like World Bank, IFC, and AFI, and also constant G2G dialogues with the administrations and regulators from other jurisdictions. Most recently, Project Dunbar brought together the Reserve Bank of Australia, Monetary Authority of Singapore, South African Reserve Bank, and the Central Bank of Malaysia with the Bank for International Settlements, BIS Innovation Hub, to test the use of Central Bank Digital Currency or CBDC for international settlements. So from the official sector to the private sector, we want a competitive finance sector and we want to promote innovation. With multiple partnerships in and out of the country, we ultimately hand over the, to the sector to take it and move forward because we are not in a business of running a business. We are the facilitator of innovation. We want commercial sector to actually pick it up and take it forward. One of the examples is like our uh, member, which is World Remit from London and Money Match, a homegrown brand. It is a perfect place where you see the regulator back the experiment through the regulatory sandbox, translated to a commercial entity, partnered with the banks and offering their services worldwide. There are a few ideas that we can uh, bring Malaysia to the forefront in this industry. And one of the ideas is truly make a better digital economy. We got to think like a physical economy and for easy physical economy to succeed, you need roads and airports, some physical infrastructure for public good so that the economy can ride and strive on it. So what does those equivalent in the digital economy? And we use it as the initial frame of reference. We came, in, we came into this fundamental infrastructure that we must have a trusted digital identity, be it a corporate or an individual, that's almost what you're going to work with and with the people that you don't see, which is why we have the session today and that is so important. The Central Bank of Malaysia rolled out risk management in technology or RMIT policy to ensure Malaysian financial institutions, including fintech companies, properly manage their cyber risk exposure by establishing the necessary risk framework, governance structure, policies, and procedures. So for eight years running, Malaysia has been benchmarked number one in the world by the Global Islamic Economic Indicator with our vibrant Islamic finance e ecosystem contributing greatly to its impressive performance. So far, I have touched on the human capital, the favorable market size, progressive regulator, and a market that emphasizes on protecting its consumer. This makes Malaysia an ideal country for you to start and scale your fintech business beyond Malaysia. A perfect spot for anyone with an eye to reach out to over 650 million people in Southeast Asia. I would like to thank the organizer for having us today. Keep safe and stay in touch. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Pua, for those um, really helpful remarks and a very comprehensive and insightful overview of the fintech opportunities and, and landscape in Malaysia. And as you say, the advantages that Malaysia has to offer in terms of human capital, in terms of market size, and in terms of, for example, a supportive regulatory environment. So thank you very much. And we will continue on now with the next keynote speech from Mr. Votan Long who is the CEO of PwC Consulting in Vietnam. So Mr. Long, it's a pleasure to have you with us and over to you. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Good morning, we can hear, hear and see you well, Mr. Long, so do carry on. Oh, you appear to be on mute now, apologies.
Mr. Long, are you able to speak? Uh, no, unfortunately, we can't hear you um, for some reason. We could hear you briefly at the beginning. I will just give you a, a minute to see if we can resolve that technical hitch and perhaps a technical team in the background will be able to assist Mr. Long in unmuting his microphone. And hopefully we will be able to hear from you in just a second, Mr. Long, um, for your overview of the Vietnamese FinTech landscape. Could you try again now, Mr. Long? Okay, no luck still with the microphone. So unfortunately from the system here, we can see that the microphone is active. Um, Mr. Long, allow me to just mute you and unmute you again and see if that activates something. So now it should be open from our side anyway. Could you try speak again, Mr. Long? No. Okay. Okay. In which case, perhaps we can move on to introducing our panelists, and then we will try and quickly come back to Mr. Long um, when we've hopefully been able to resolve that technical issue with the microphone. So, and I'm really delighted to see um, a question coming through on the Q&A as well already. So I would really encourage participants who are listening in, do please make the most of that Q&A function um, to put, to input some questions for those people joining. So we will move on and introduce our panelists and hopefully be able to go back in just a minute to hear from Mr. Long about the exciting opportunities here in Vietnam as well. Um, but I think it's really clear from what we've hear, heard so far from our speakers that the opportunity in Southeast Asia in the areas of FinTech and cybersecurity are just are, are really growing very rapidly now. Um, and that, that offers many, many opportunities for new players to tap into this market. And I think UK businesses are particularly well positioned to be leaning into some of these opportunities. So I think it's wonderful that we've got some representatives of a variety of, of excellent UK businesses in both FinTech and cybersecurity joining us today for this panel discussion. And our goal really in the panel discussion will be to really tap into the expertise of these companies and hear from them to get their ideas and perspectives, examples and tips to help any UK businesses who might be listening in and considering these markets to really identify where the opportunities upcoming are and what some of the challenges might be and ultimately set themselves up um, for success in Southeast Asia. So. Um, I will just briefly um, ask each of the panellists to introduce themselves and their company so that we know who we, who we will have for this discussion. Um, as I say, they're all representatives of UK companies. We've got Mr. Elian Sitono, the country manager for Indonesia and head of expansion in Asia Pacific of WISE. We've got Ms. Avashi Gupta, the regional manager for Southeast Asia from Onfido. And we've got Miss Paris Chua, the account manager lead for Southeast Asia from BEA Systems, and Mr. Sanjay Arora, the managing director for Asia Pacific at Dark Trace. So as I say, if you could just each very briefly introduce yourself and your company. Let's start off with Eliane, if you're there. Hi, thank you, Emily. Hi, um, I'm Eliane. As mentioned, I'm currently the country manager for WISE in Indonesia and also leading expansion efforts for WISE in Asia Pacific region. Um, 
If you haven't heard about our company, probably you have heard about our previous name, which is TransferWise. We recently rebranded to Wise. Um, we are actually a, a global technology company trying to build the best way to move money around the world. So we power people, individuals, and businesses to move money around the world, to send and receive globally, as well as spend anywhere in the world. And a lot of large institutions and financial institutions start using our technology and payment infrastructures to power their customers' needs for global payments as well. Um, we are actively expanding in Southeast Asia, and now we are, uh, have received licenses in Singapore, Malaysia, and Indonesia. Nice to meet you, everyone. Brilliant. Thank you so much for joining. And as you say, a company that will be known to many people with customers around the world. So great to have you here. Um, Avashi, can I come to you next? Absolutely. Thank you, Emily. So my name is Urvashi Gupta. I also go by Urvi. That's easier. Uh, and I'm the general manager for Unfido in APAC. So that's covering all markets, you know, from India all the way to Australia and New Zealand. And, uh, you know, contrary to WISE, um, you know, I think very few people may have heard of us because we're primarily a B2B player. Um, and what we do is we, um, we develop um, technology that allows financial institutions to uh, easily onboard users onto, you know, whatever uh, a platform where they can then provide products and services to them. So to give you a, a very famous example, Revolut, uh, you know, which basically issues credit cards digitally, they don't have any branches, they use our technology. When you sign up for Revolut, they will ask uh, you to take a picture of your government issued photo ID and a selfie. And we take that information and basically tell a customer like Revolut in less than five minutes whether this user is genuine and we feel that it's safe for you know, the company to onboard them onto its platform. So, so Revolut is a great uh, global example, but you know, I, I'm pleased to say we've been in uh, Asia for th over three years now, and we have lots and lots of local customers ranging from fintechs like Big Pay to you know, um, uh, uh, um, leading you know, uh, banks such as DBS Bank as well. So, so that's really what we do, and I'm looking forward to chatting more on the panel later. Thank you very much, Evi. And um, as you say, it's a it's a service that is more and more required by different companies um, as the days and months go by. So um, fantastic to hear more about that. I'm actually just gonna press pause on the panelist introductions because I think we have Mr. Long back online. Um, so we will go back to our last keynote speaker, Mr. Long for an overview of the Vietnamese FinTech market and then um, keeping you all in suspense to meet our final two panelists when we come back to the panel dis discussion. So Mr. Long, very sorry about the previous technical issues and hopefully resolved now and over to you. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. Uh, really apologize for the technology uh, issue, uh, which is supposed not supposed to be uh, happened with me, uh, a uh, person with the technology background. So uh, in the next 10 minutes, I would like to share with you the view on the FinTech in Vietnam. I think this is a very interesting view uh, from a country with the 95 million uh, of the people, but uh, with 141 million of the mobile phone subscriber and soon to be, you know, with the 105 million of the consumers on the e-commerce side. So this is just to show you the uh, potential of the financial services uh, using technology here in Vietnam. Uh, can we move to the next slide, please? And uh, I think one of the very key driver for the growth of the financial services in Vietnam is belong to fintech. The, the credit belong to the fintech. Uh, and uh, if, if you see the uh, financial inclusion rate in Vietnam before uh, 2010 was not really great. And then uh, when the State Bank uh, of Vietnam embarked on the cashless society directions, uh, we do see that the financial inclusion become a very strong uh, motto within the country and among the financial services provider. And hence, it also provide a very good ground for fintech companies to grow in Vietnam. So can you go to the next slide, please? And uh, this is, this is uh, 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 there's a reason why we would say that FinTech is uh, playing a very important role in financial inclusion in Vietnam, because uh, of course, beside the technology, beside the much better customer experience, which is they 
provide. Uh, this is this is a really a good way uh, to open up the access to the finance and services, which is sometimes is not available for a country uh, like Vietnam before. Uh, it's not only about the faster and cheaper digital experience. It's not only about the tool and advice for the client, uh, for the customer to manage their finance, but also uh, you know uh, start looking into the investment management advisory, uh, looking into the uh, some niche uh, customer uh, segmentation which is underserved in Vietnam. And uh, last but not least, it's about the faster, cheaper, and more convenient payment, which is very important in Vietnam. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? And uh, talking about the payment, if you look at the uh, uh, fintech startup in Vietnam and, and really asking the question who they are, then I would say that the payment is playing probably you know, the major part of these uh, fintech communities. Uh, based on a different uh, assessment or, or uh, you know, statistic, uh, we might see that about one third of the fintech here in Vietnam is focused on payment. Uh, the evidently, we see that uh, these, uh, and, and, and by the way, payment uh, services is uh, regulated by the State Bank of Vietnam. Uh, in Vietnam, there's 39 uh, license issued by uh, Sipanya Vietnam to the non-bank uh, payment service providers. And it's compared to the numbers of the bank, you know, uh, also uh, almost the same, then this is a present a tremendous, uh, 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 you know, numbers of the, uh, of the company who playing in this uh, area. If we look at the volume of the transaction and payment in Vietnam in uh, 2000 and, uh, uh, 2020, uh, which is last year, we see that the volume is about 11.6 million, a billion of US dollars. And that volume will be doubled in, in the next five years. So this is, uh, you know, just to uh, uh, illustrate the, 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 fast, the, the, the fast growth segment in terms of payment. Uh, but at the same time, if we look at the uh, fintech landscape, we also see very strong growth uh, between the P2P lending as well as the crypto and blockchain space. This is a space where, you know, uh, especially, uh, I'm taught it's niche, but it's especially uh, attractive to Vietnam market, provided that, you know, uh, so far the finance and services provided by FinTech is mostly focused on the uh, payment. Uh, having uh, pay, uh, lending and especially uh, the peer-to-peer -peer lending uh, as an alternative to banks uh, services, it's uh, very attractive to Vietnam uh, at this time. Uh, we also see that in the last two years, the uh, insurance, uh, insurtech, uh, as well as the digital banking, uh, uh, fintech is also, uh, you know, growing very uh, rapidly. Uh, insurtech, it's, it's a quite a obvious answer to the uh, growth of the insurance market in Vietnam during the COVID-19 uh, and, and not only in Vietnam, but also in other countries. Uh, we also see, you know, the uh, the development of Timo, the first digital bank in Vietnam, created in 2015, and and, and now, you know, moving uh, toward uh, the growth uh, with the uh, very significant investment into their technology basis to capture more customers as well as the driving uh, for better customer experience. Uh, we also uh, do see that, you know very important roles in the fintech movement in Vietnam play uh, the ecosystem uh, uh, of, the, of the services. Uh, so a super app such as like Grab, uh, it's, it's really uh, playing uh, important role here. Uh, and behind that, we do believe that, you know, this is the one ecosystem of the services and products being uh, consolidated together with the uh, banking and finance and services to uh, provide a better experience to the, uh, the, the, the customers uh, in Vietnam, right? So <clears throat> uh, this, is, this is about the landscape, which is we might see in Vietnam. Uh, then the question is that, e, what, what might be the investment opportunities uh, in Vietnam uh, in, into FinTech? In first quarter in 2021, according to next uh, statistic, uh, we uh, see that, you know, uh, it's believed to be that about 100 million is being 
uh, invested into uh, Vietnam. And it's increased the total amount of the investment in Vietnam in the last three years by 33%. Uh, Vietnam uh, become a, a more and more attractive in terms of fintech uh, for the uh, foreign investor. Uh, some of the very successful um, investment uh, or, or uh, the uh, into the Vietnam fintech, such as uh, you know, uh, Viet, uh, VN Life, uh, one of the fintech focusing on payment uh, in Vietnam, and then probably play a very important role among the banks uh, as well as the non-bank provider in terms of uh, you know install payment uh, as well as the uh, other payment in the in the market. Uh, that company got about 500 million of the investment into. Uh, from the foreign investor into their uh, technology infrastructure as well as the uh, market activity to develop a, a wider network of the customers. Another uh, uh, fintech I would name is Momo, uh, who is also uh, got the investment of about 233 million uh, into uh, uh, to really drive the large amounts of the customers, uh, which is believed uh, now is up to about 25 million uh, in, in the countries. Uh, and, and we can con continue with the list of the investments and then uh, there's numbers of the other smaller uh, uh, investment into the blockchain, into the digital banking uh, platform uh, in the country. So this is uh, give you a, a view and a sense on what does it mean to uh, invest into the fintech in Vietnam. Uh, the question is that uh, what are the conditions uh, or support from the regulatory uh, side to the investor into uh, into fintech in Vietnam and. Uh, I have to say that, you know, if we compare to the other countries uh, in the region, uh, Vietnam is driving forward uh, the very favorable condition for uh, investment into fintech, especially into the services, which is uh, foster the um, financial inclusion. Uh, so that's why um, uh, the state bank government uh, the State Bank uh, of Vietnam also opened up the governance committee uh, for the fintech and uh, poised to support the uh, penetration as well as the uh, expansion of the fintech into more of the financial services. Uh, with that, I uh, think that um, I would conclude my presentation here and uh, uh, leave the time for the uh, for the audience to uh, talk to the panelists and, and then uh, I'll, I'll be here around. Uh, if you have any questions, I will be more than happy to, to answer. Thank you very, very much, Mr. Lom. Um, a really interesting and comprehensive overview, I think, of the fintech market in Vietnam and obviously the opportunities there as you were highlighting at the beginning from a, a young tech savvy population with high internet penetration, but quite low financial inclusion. So huge opportunities for FinTech and obviously um, companies there, massive growth in payments, but also in so, so many other areas of FinTech as well. So thank you very much for those thoughts. Um, and we will now return back to our panel discussion and continue meeting some of our excellent panel members. Um, so as you'll remember, we already met uh, Mr. Elian Siptono of WISE, uh, a very well-known payment service provider, and Ms. Irvi of Onfido, a uh, EKYC company, uh, electronic know your customer company. Um, so I will move on now to um, Ms. Paris Chua from BAE Systems. Paris, if you're able to briefly introduce yourself and your company. Yes, certainly. Um, first of all, thank you for having me here for today's panel discussion. Delighted to join everybody. So I am from BAE Systems Applied Intelligence, which is really with a single goal and mission to protect the organization's financial institutions and public sectors 
from financial crime. So our parent company is probably more well known and we are a member or part of the BAE systems, which is a cybersecurity defense aerospace company. And from which we are able to build on the strong security and engineering heritage to move that to provide defense for businesses. So in Southeast Asia, which is the region I look after right now, we see tremendous opportunities. I think everybody has heard from the panel earlier. There's no doubt that digital adoption is accelerating. I think one of the positive, I would say, developments coming from what has been a long drawn COVID-19 situation. So on the back of which the businesses definitely need defense. And likewise, as consumers like us is adapting very quickly to digitalization, the financial crimes or the financial criminals are also on the path to digitalize their approaches. So this is where we come in and hope to provide the necessary support for the businesses to further their growth. Yeah, thank you. Brilliant, thank you very much for that introduction, Paris. Yeah, as you say, as the uh, opportunities increase in digital, so do some of the threats, and so <sighs> the need for that cybersecurity is really, really crucial. Um, and I'll move over now to um, Sanjay, if you're able to introduce yourself from Dark Trace and another cybersecurity company that we have on the panel. Absolutely, and good morning, everyone. Good afternoon uh, to people in Asia. My name is Sanjay. I am the managing director for Dark Trace, based out of Singapore. I was one of the founding members of Dark Trace Asia, employee number one. So I'm here to share my insight as to how this journey has been, how we work with the UK government and the various agencies. Delighted to be on this panel. Uh, Dark Trace, as some of you may know, is the global leader of cybersecurity technology, uh, proudly founded and based in Cambridge, UK. Our journey began in 2013, where we adopted a unique AI-based approach. In fact, we are the first to commercialize AI for full-blown cybersecurity. Today, we are deployed in over 5,500 companies across 100 countries who every day protect their critical infrastructure, their digital assets, their people from clever, sophisticated cyber attacks using our self-learning AI and the capability to respond autonomously. So, so that's our core product line, and I'm here to share more as we progress in the panel. Thank you very much for having me here. Brilliant. Well, thank you for being here, and I'm really looking forward to it. That must have been an amazing journey to have witnessed and to have been part of over a relatively short space of time. Um, so very interested to hear more about that and some of the, the lessons and reflections over mm -hmm. the course of the discussion. Um, so we'll kick off now properly into the panel discussion. And to open us up into this topic, the first question that I'd like to put to you all is really what do you see as the most significant opportunities in the fintech and the cybersecurity space in Southeast Asia? What, what drew you to enter these markets in particular? as opposed to other markets um, in the region, for example. And what solutions and expertise does your company then, then have to offer in, in these spaces? So really all about the opportunities and what, what drew you to these markets. Um, so I think I'll put this question to all of you as quite a broad question. But if we can start with Avashi from on Friday. Sure, sure. Happy to... Yeah. Can you hear me clearly? Yes. Great. Um, uh, so thank, thank you, uh, you know, again for the um, uh, invitation to sit on this panel and, and uh, talk about these interesting questions. So, you know, from our standpoint at Onpedo, it's, it's definitely the accelerated consumption and actually my standpoint as a consumer as well, right? You know, we, um, we are consuming financial services remotely and in a purely digital manner in a way we've never done before. Um, in fact, I applied for a credit card just this morning and not only was the entire, entire journey digital, so was the authentication and I was even approved within minutes. And I actually don't remember even a few years ago you know, being a Singaporean with my info and all of that, being able to go through the journey that quickly. So, and and really, you know, we feel that this is the kind of experience that a lot of financial institutions are vying to provide. So, so we at Onpedo enable the identity verification portion of the journey, as I mentioned earlier, to, so sorry about the drilling. <laughs> we could still hear you just about. That's great. I I'm, I apologize <laughs> for the drilling. Um, so um, realities of uh, working from home. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, so yeah, coming back to what we as Onfido, you know, um, 
the solutions that we provide, I touched upon it earlier, it's, you know, the IDV portion of verifying who the customer is saying they are, giving that information back to the FI really quickly so that they can then make a decision within minutes because that's what today's consumer is expecting. Um, so what drew us to this region is really the massive scope for companies in this region, right? Um, first of all, there's millions who are already banked who are expecting better and better experiences. They're constantly applying for new products, whether is it, you know, credit cards, buy now, pay later, or uh, anything else really. Um, but also the hundreds of millions who are still unbanked. And that's where the, the real opportunity is, right? Where you're, um, you know, very quickly digitally signing up all of these users. And we see this trend playing out with the digital banking efforts and licenses being issued across the region as well, specifically, you know, in Malaysia and Philippines and Indonesia, um, it's, it's been happening on an ongoing basis. And I think Vietnam starting to uh, look into it as well. So, so that's really what drew us to this region. Great, thank you very much. And um, yeah, I mean, financial services are just so rapidly being transformed by digital um, technologies, aren't they? But as you say, particularly in this part of the world, there's not only the millions of users looking to improve the service that they get, but also the millions that are unbanked and therefore open um, for taking up these new opportunities. Eliane from WISE, can I turn to you next for your thoughts on this, this question about the opportunities and what drew you to these markets? Sure. So I think like a lot of the, the panelists and like also the speakers address this, but Southeast Asia is like a very um, growing region for digital services, right? It's like a, it's a hotspot for digital services. If you think about it, like around 70% of Southeast Asia population are using digital services connected online. So that means like around 400 million of people are craving for digital services. And this is even more important during the COVID situation. So I think I, uh, on a Google report on the economy of the digital economy, around a third of people just turn using the digital services during the COVID situation. So it just means like the, the trend is just keeps growing and more and more people will require digital services. For us as a payment in tech company, this is also like a similar trend that we have seen. So like, uh, I think Google expect that the payment, a digital payment industry will grow to around 1.2 trillion uh, by 2025. So it like it's a it's a big and massive market for us as a payment company, and the second thing is that uh, people, um, regulators, and also industry are very adept to innovations. So if you think about it, like in Indonesia, for example, like just now, Pak Sugeng shared that uh, Bank Indonesia is making a lot of you know, a lot of push towards the digital payments, like with the PIFS um, payment system blueprint. So these, these are things that we have seen across the different countries in Southeast Asia. And at the same time, the industry itself is also pushing towards this innovation. And in the end, it also means that people are slowly more open to digital payments, digital solutions, and people are slowly changing from being case basis to digital payments. And this is something also that we always look at when we enter a market. Mm -hmm. So just to share a little bit more advice, like, what we are really truly solving is like the, the problem of moving money around the world. When we enter the Indonesian market, so we, we ask the customer, what is the challenges that you face in digital payment, uh, especially cross-border transfers? So this customer answered that it's a matter of cost, speed, convenience, and also transparency are very lacking in the, in the industry right now. And this is what WISE is actually really good at, right? So we are trying to bring the cheapest uh, services for the customer. I think we are around two and a half times cheaper than computers in Indonesia. Around 40%, uh, 38% uh, of our transfers are instant globally. And we are also striving to bring a lot of transparency to the remittance industry. So these are the things that we are looking for. Like we are trying to solve uh, what customers' pain points are, and we are trying to bring the best services for the customers. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And yeah, as you say, a real hotspot and the COVID-19 situation has only accelerated demand, but really interesting as well, your point about um, kind of business regulators and a sort of openness to supporting innovation that is obviously so key. Um, for companies like like yours and others on the panel. Um, Paris, from more the cybersecurity angle, 
if I could bring you in on this question as, as where you see the most significant opportunities and, and why these markets are so of interest. Okay, um, I'll touch on the fin crime aspect. I'll leave the cyber cybersecurity to the expert, Sanjay. <laughs> for the next part, I think um, Uvashi and Ilian, they have set their stage very well for what I was going to say at first um, or subsequently. Um, first of all, customers' expectations. I think nobody can deal with the fact that you got to you know, send in the credit card application form and wait for like two weeks to get your credit card. So the expectations has changed and likewise the growth double digit in digital transactions and these are the very reasons why most people win, don't really talk about it but the regulatory landscape is getting very complex and very challenging so there are three aspects where we feel they are presenting very good opportunities for us at Bay Systems Applied Intelligence so first of all would be touched on by all the panelists that is the accelerated growth in the volume of digital transactions the evolving regulatory landscape. I think over the past couple of weeks, we have seen how US regulators try to clamp down on Coinbase and even on Robinhood on how they manage the um, crypto assets. And that's the last part on cryptocurrencies and digital assets. So the banks are facing headwinds from this multiple fronts on how they can deal with the growing digital volume and how they can assess risk and, comply, and while complying to the regulatory requirements more effectively. So we have heard from customers that they need a reliable partner to help them in this endeavor. So at Bay Systems, we have been helping our customers building the defense system that is against bin crime for the last two decades. And we know we have close connections with the regulators and we have the data expertise in this area to help the customers navigate. And at the same time for Southeast Asia, there is a strong demand for machine learning operations. Everybody is talking about machine learning, but how do you operationalize it? Like you have the data, then you need to collect the data, you need to clean the data, and you need to have the right experts to help you to put that into machine learning models that work. So at Bay, we have the right people, we have the expertise. So we felt that this is an area that we can basically bring our knowledge and solutions meaningfully to Southeast Asia financial institutions. Great, thank you. Um, yeah, as you say, lots of challenges from just massively increasing volume of digital transactions and evolving regulatory landscape and how do you ensure compliance, but also opportunities with cryptocurrency and machine learning. Um, so a lot of exciting trends to touch on there. Um, Sanjay from Darktrace, can I bring you in for, for your views on this, opportunities yep. and what drew you here and, and what solutions and expertise your company has to offer in that context too? Yeah, yeah. So I think we've discussed the rapid explosion of fintech. We've talked about the born in cloud companies. We've talked about how companies are racing to get you know, customer experience initiatives going. But what we haven't spoken about really in this so far, and maybe I can shed more light there is, the traditional companies, the traditional banks and the telcos and the governments and the power plants, um, there is a massive requirement in the brick and mortar and click and mortar world as well, which is all about how do we embrace a modern way to minimize disruption that cyber attacks will happen. Now, cyber attackers and cyber threats do not look at boundaries. They don't carry passports or need visas. I'm sorry if this sounds cliche. So I would not put uh, these three countries as a hotbed for opportunity. I think the way we have worked is no company or network is immune to cyber attacks. And if you look at on one hand, what our distinguished panelists have been talking about is the need for embracing digital, modernizing, speed, using data. Um, paperless, whatever we talked. On the other hand, you look at the cyber attackers, right? The attacks of ransomware, the really clever attacks of supply chain. And by the way, these countries have a huge number of manufacturing SMEs who are connected in a way to the big supply chains. So the problem is not just about the modern world. The problem is throughout these countries, companies of all shapes and sizes, they require a modern way of looking at solving this problem. And our experience has been, like I mentioned earlier, by understanding what their businesses are, our self-learning approach, which doesn't rely on retrospective data, which doesn't rely on rules and signatures. 
is able to protect them in real time from net new attacks, be it ransomware, be it cloud data exfiltration, be it attacks on industrial networks. So that's our approach and we cover the entire spectrum of all industries and of all sizes. Thank you. Yeah, I, yeah, I really, that's so interesting. All businesses of all shapes and sizes because of the rapid change in customer expectations, yep. we have to embrace this digitalization. But as you say, throws up all of these different challenges for different businesses who, who need to be able to protect themselves. Um, so yeah, another huge angle on the opportunity uh, in, in these markets, I think. So I think that's given a really um, exciting overview of the level of opportunity, but as always, I'm sure businesses are also equally interested in what are some of the key challenges when you're entering these markets and, and how can a company conduct business effectively in these markets? And particularly one of the things that has come up on the Q&A already is around um, data innovation and, and privacy regulation as, as potentially a particular area of challenge if you're entering these markets. So it would be great to get all of your views with your experience operating uh, in this part of the world. Um, on those questions. So Paris, could I come to you first on, on this one in terms of what do you see as the key challenges for businesses oh, to be aware of? Yeah, I think for us, um, we provide the thin crime solutions. So the challenges faced by us specifically may not be the same for the other businesses. And for us, it's important to have a true collaboration among the financial institutions, regulators and vendors since Finding financial crime is not like a siloed activity. So for us, we work very closely with the regulators. Like in Malaysia, clearly we work with BN, BN Bank Nigara, and in Singapore with MAS. So at the same time, we have also a fin crime intelligence unit. It's more like a closed user loop network that we set up since you know Bay has started offering the solution to our users. And as long as you're a customer of our applied intelligence financial crime solution, you can automatically sign up. And from time to time, we'll organize events, get together, share ideas, and understand the latest trends, particularly hearing from insights like the FATF and the ACAMS to know what's going on. So this is where we have the closed-loop intelligence sharing, which is key to our business, may not be the same for the other business types. And the other challenge would be understanding the data regulatory requirements, which I think is one of the questions raised by the attendees. This is a tricky one. Um, while the financial institutions are exploring on moving their business to cloud, then there comes the need to fulfill the regulators' requirements. And for us specifically, we deal with customers' data, which is sensitive. And at the same time, this is where we have to tread very carefully to understand you know, the central bank's point of view, to basically align with the compliance that the banks have internally and then work out what is the right approach towards this. So clarity on that front is important and we see that as one of the greatest challenge. And the other challenge would naturally be the nuance in the cultural differences among the countries, like you know, how um, the behaviors are like, the work of the work culture is different. So this is something that is more, I would think, implicit that businesses would have to observe when they want to grow their business in these countries. Yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah, I can imagine clarity on what is required under regulation, particularly around data protection, is, is a key challenge. And as you say, um, as well as being aware of cultural differences. But I am really glad we've got a real range of different businesses on this panel. So great to get different takes on this question. Um, Eliane from WISE, I'll come to you next on how, what you see yeah. as challenges. Sure. I think like Paris mentioned a good, good thing, like a very relevant thing, which is the diversity. So like for companies in the UK or uh, from the US, like generally we hear about Southeast Asia, we might think about it like one very typical, very synchronized region. In fact, it's not, right? Every country has very different culture, different language and it have different regulators and the regulators also interpret things differently. So I think for companies that really want to enter this region really want, really need to spend some efforts understanding what is really happening in its country and also building relationships and understanding regulations one by one in, in every specific countries. Um, the second thing will be um, in our experience also, customers expect some degree of high 
localized uh, services. So um, unlike in the EU, where it can be very similar for the whole regions in, the, in, in Southeast Asia, customers are really accustomed with having very localized services from their local players. That could be, for example, like a local uh, CS supports in a local language. And then also we need, really need to spend some time to understand what is the uh, usual behavior of the customers. For example, in the Southeast Asia, credit card is not a common use. Now more and more e-wallet is more prominent way of paying. So these kind of trends we need to really understand um, specifically for each country. And I think for the payment industry specifically, um, a lot of the challenges relies on the transparency of costs. Um, in, in these regions, like a lot of customers really are blindfolded in terms of what are they pay in terms of a payment. For example, remittance, they are not necessarily aware of what is actually uh, embedded in the FX rate. Um, there is also hidden charges in there. And this is something also that we are spending a lot of time to educate customers and bringing transparency on the region. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Great, thank you. And I think that's really um, good advice for businesses thinking of coming into the region, just underlining that point about the diversity and the, the need to really do your research um, and know the local market and uh, local actors as far as possible as well before you make your move. So thank you. Um, Sanjay, it would be great to get your take in, in terms of cybersecurity. How should a company do business in this region? And particularly, I guess, your perspective of having been on a real journey since the very beginning of Dark Trace. Um, what are the challenges and how has that changed? Right. Right. So maybe a little different because, uh, you know, everybody will talk about, yes, rightly, the culture and the context of heterogeneity. But my take would be focus on the problem we are solving, focus on the issues the customers are facing. So in our case, for example, what are we solving? We are solving the disruption that cyber attackers are causing by net new attacks, right? So that's the problem we are solving and how we are solving is by ability to understand normal of an organization, whether the organization is in the US or Vietnam, it doesn't really matter to us, right? We, we are using AI to establish what's normal and we are using AI to respond to those threats to minimize disruption. So my advice and my experience has been focus on the problem. And if there is a new, unique, strong way of solving that problem, these countries offer a fantastic opportunity. I'm not saying do not respect the various cultures and the context. Absolutely, that's given. Uh, but these opportunities in the market today are rapidly growing. As, I, as everybody has talked about, these countries represent an opportunity for, uh, for us, uh, you know, people who are starting up businesses or, or people who are listening, because the, there is an opportunity for companies to embrace leapfrog, right? With all the new countries that are developing, if you may, there is an opportunity for a, a leapfrog to happen. So if you have a cutting edge technology, you're solving a fundamental problem, uh, that's a great place to market yourself. Mm. Again, great advice, I think, for businesses watching this, you know, focus on the problem, the issue customers face and what your cutting edge solution is and, and go from there. Um, great. And um, last but by no means least, Avashi, can I bring you in on this question of challenges? Absolutely. Um, and, and, you know, I think our fellow panelists, um, you know, have already detailed a lot of the typical struggles that uh, co uh, companies like us face, you know, when expanding in Southeast Asia. I think one example I'd like to share of kind of how we've, you know, been, been fortunate to be able to um, get around these uh, situations uh, is uh, one example is a customer in Malaysia really wanted to use our services. And so they actually took us to Bank Nagara, Malaysia, and they opened the door for us there. And they and then they allowed us to enter the regulator sandbox and we were able to prove our technology. And that really set, you know, basically um, opened up the, the uh, market for us in Malaysia with, with, you know, such an open regulator really helping to um, 
um, be, you know, be be willing to kind of experiment with new services and then and then on a case by case basis offer offer that um, you know approval for companies to use us. So so that's one way in which we have engaged successfully, and we're very excited to you know do that with regulators in in other markets as well. But um, apart from that, you know, it's it's the typical uh, challenges laid by our panelists. Uh, another example I think that we specifically encounter is data localization. So not just data privacy, but you know data not being able to cross borders. So that's something that I believe you know our, uh, the um, companies that our fellow panelists are from would be uh, experiencing as well. Um, but you know it's 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 understandable that each country would want sovereignty over their data and you know making sure that we are adherence to uh, laws such as GDPR. So those are some of the typical challenges we encounter and and work to solve. Mm -hmm. Um. Great. Yeah. Data localization, like you say, another really important aspect of the challenges alongside privacy and um, a great tip there as well in terms of thinking about partnerships and ways into a market with a with an existing partner from, from elsewhere. Thank you for that. So um, what I'm really interested to probe some of you on a bit further now is looking into the future from here. So we've heard about how quickly the markets in this part of the world are emerging and evolving and growing. Um, so I'd be really interested in what what are your takes as what are the most significant emerging digital trends that you see in this region and that are affecting your business? Um, so I will go to um, Paris. Can I come back to you on this first of all? Yeah, certainly. I think for us, we have recognized that there will be continuous phishing attempts. Um, data leaks will not stop at the most recent ones. There will continuously be companies being you know, exposed to having their data being leaked to the dark web and selling from there. So there'll be a rise in social engineering. And I think this is one of the key challenges the financial institutions are facing right now. How do you know whether this identity is real or not, right? And leading to which then comes the challenge of your client due diligence, you know, the watch list management, your name screening, and of course the money laundering. So with the rise of digital transactions, it's not going to stop. It's just going to accelerate, especially when we have all the digital banking licenses that are going to be issued um, by, you know, Malaysia, Indonesia, and possibly Thailand as well in the near term. So when this happens, the scale of transaction is just going to go up double digit. The banks will come under pressure. And if the situation continues as such, whereby the compliance teams will have to split team and work from home, again, there will be an issue on the human capital side. So on both fronts, the, the banks are actually facing challenges. You have like consumers, you know, continuously having the transactions going on. Then you have the criminals, you know, also embarking digitalization and you have teams who are like working from home. So this will be the key challenges. And also some of the trends that we'll see, there'll be no stop in social engineering. And at the same time, the most exciting part is the rise of virtual currencies or the rise of digital assets. So the banks and the financial institutions at large will have to grapple very quickly with all the regulatory changes. And the compliance users on one hand will have to be educated like you know, on this new space that they suddenly have to get accustomed to, the new way of doing things and the new typologies or the behavioral patterns that will emerge. So the rate and the variety of money laundering will change and so will be fraud. So this will be the rising trends that we'll see moving forward. Wow, thank you. That's uh, such an interesting overview. And as you say, yeah, traditional actors like banks are going to be facing this increased demand from customers, but also managing <laughs> yes. teams from home and an increasing uh, uh, increasing criminal activity as well. Um, and then more broadly, you've got more virtual currencies and digital assets um, as, a, as a really up and coming area too. Thank you. Um, Irvi, can I get your views on this question? Emerging yeah. trends? Definitely. I think what we see... Um, a lot of customers coming to us for is really trying to, you know, make sure that they're building the smoothest onboarding journey possible. And I think that's, uh, you know, in our view, becoming a very critical point of differentiation for the different financial services providers, because ultimately your customers' uh, patience right now is, is very short. So they're going to either try and get through the journey very quickly. And if they can't, you know, there's five other providers and companies that they can choose from. So user experience and um, just 
the UX that you design and the way you interact with your user and how much friction you create before your user can sign up. We feel that it's really key and becoming a differentiator based on the, the asks that we get from our customers. So, so that's an emerging trend we've observed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I can see that, you know, there's increasing options aren't there and your expectations go up as a customer and therefore if it doesn't happen instantly, you just go elsewhere. Um, so yeah, very interesting on that. Um, Sanjay, from Dark Tracer's perspective, I'd be interested in your views on emerging digital trends, but also perhaps to broaden out this question a little further on, on your views as well as to what the initiatives out there in terms of support for the tech e ecosystem have been like in this part of the world, sure. um, the kind of future trends, but also what's the support that's available. Right. So that's that's a very the broad thing. So as everybody knows, the attack surface with all the rapid digitization and and all the initiatives we are talking about, the the threat surface has increased tremendously. Right. It is not possible to secure whatever you want to secure. Uh, using the traditional approach of securing enterprises. So that's first headline I want to place. The second is the complexity and the speed of attacks that we are seeing, whether it's ransomware, whether it's the disruption ransomware causes, for example, the Colonial Pipeline. Human teams will not be able to scale and match this. It is no longer a human scalable problem that we can solve by putting more humans at this problem. Artificial intelligence has become mainstream and it'll continue to increase its usage. Again, small to largest of the large, they all will need to deploy uh, artificial intelligence, which is able to understand these problems and respond in machine time when, uh, for example, the security team members are on the weekend or, or having a coffee break. That's, that's again a given. Now, where, where are we uh, on this journey when it comes to various countries? Uh, as we had heard from all the distinguished panelists, every country has a, a very significant amount of focus around cyber resilience and cybersecurity. I think the focus is shifting from a digital trend, if you may, is cyber threats are inevitable, but can we get cyber resilient? How quickly or how, how much minimum disruption that can happen once you are attacked? Right? So I think that's the shift of focus. Uh, from another threat perspective, I think I've mentioned this before, uh, ransomware attacks at the speed of machine and supply chain attacks, especially in this region. I think we need to pay attention to the fact that there are suppliers who are connected to very large organizations globally, and, and they could be soft targets where the ad adversaries are trying to enter the larger networks using these smaller uh, part of the uh, supply chain. So that will again become very important as a digital, uh, as a trend. Going to your uh, question around uh, the various agencies, as I mentioned, every country today has significant amount of interest and agency set up to provide advice, to provide certifications, to provide guidelines around how cybersecurity for companies should be, how data protection laws should be. So as again, as cybersecurity providers, we all need to work in alignment and understanding of how these policies and guidelines are emerging. And there's a lot of emphasis at the board level at the minister's level, at, at general level, right? The awareness around cyber resilience is right now really high and uh, that represents a very positive move for everybody here. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. And yes, sorry to throw quite a broad question at you, but I think you covered all of that really well. And as you say, in the future, AI just is gonna have to be part of the solutions it needs to be. Um, but that's really interesting what you say as well about this shift of focus towards cyber resilience. The attacks are inevitable. Um, how resilient can you be? How quickly can you bounce back? Um, as well as, yeah, likelihood of increasing ransomware and supply chain attacks as an area of focus. But great to hear that authorities um, are very kind of aware of these issues and engaging with businesses, I think. So that, that is a good place to be, as you say. Um, Elian from WISE, can I bring you in on this um, more from the, 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 the kind of fintech perspective? Um, anything you want to add in terms of emerging digital trends and, and in particular, anything that you would add in terms of the, the tech ecosystem in Indonesia, Malaysia, Vietnam, and what support has been available to you when you're tapping into the market? What more could be done in your view to support UK companies? Yeah, so I think 
there are a lot of posts from the government across these three the, the countries that you mentioned towards digital ecosystem and digital economy. And that's even specifically true for the payment industry. For example, just now, like, again, I mentioned Bank Indonesia's initiative on fast payment system or QR or mobile payments um, uh, infrastructure, like the IFAS, Chris, and then from BNM, we have do it now. Similarly, in other um, Southeast Asia market, we are, uh, regulators are trying to push this newer, faster, more convenient digital payment infrastructures for the customer. And I think at West, this is even more important because it kind of like signifies the shift from the customers and from the industry towards digital payment, which is the industry that we are like kind of like trying to solve and enter into. So we are kind of like benefiting, benefiting from these shifts from the government and also from the industry towards the digital payment. Um, as a UK company, WISE itself is benefiting from the support from PIP and British Embassy. Um, uh, I think we greatly uh, appreciate the support from the PIP um, when we are trying to enter Indonesia, trying to understand what is our situation, what is our challenges, and also for them to spend a lot of efforts trying to untangle these problems for us and working with the local regulators. I think that is something that really we really want to mention and appreciate the support from the UK government here. Um, but yeah, I think on top of that, like we we also see that this initiative is a good omen, and we really want to work closer with the lo local regulators to bring our services on the ground. Great, thank you. And um, obviously very delighted to hear that you've had a good experience of support from DIT, the UK's Department for International Trade um, that I work for as well. Um, you know, as, as you say, we've got teams on the ground in all of these markets and we are there to help UK companies, both in terms of understanding some of the barriers faced in markets and working with you to, to raise them with authorities and, and try to influence the future shape of the market, but also in terms of specific business support and working together on, on things like um, promotion where we can. So I would definitely encourage anyone listening in today to get in touch with us if we might be able to be of help. And I know later on we will put contact details up in the, the chat box to make sure that you are able to do that. Um, but also, as you say, I think really key that companies in these markets that are emerging and evolving so quickly, so the regulation is is often kind of almost catching up with the level with the rate at which the demand and market is developing it's so important that that companies like yourselves are working hand in hand with with authorities and helping them to understand some of the challenges and great that i think we do have um some of, of groups of authorities in these countries that are quite open-minded and focused on supporting innovation and supporting investment which is a good starting place to be in um, so I think we've we've covered quite a lot of ground from opportunities to um, some of the key challenges, some of the trends for the future, some of what the uh, support system is is like, and the support that some of you have received. Um, I would be really keen to give each of you a, a, a decent opportunity as well to give us some some closing thoughts across all of that. What, what are your kind of key takeaways that you would hope that anyone listening in would take away from today's discussion? And what is it that, that maybe you, you wish you or your companies had, had known or been aware of before entering these markets? Any kind of points like that that you would like to leave us with as we move towards the end of the panel discussion? Um, so I, I will give you each a chance to, to do that and then add a few reflections of my own at the end. Um, Avashi, can I start with, with you for some kind of closing thoughts? Sure, sure. Um, so, you know, it's been, uh, like I mentioned, it's been a three-year journey for us so far. Um, and, you know, like some of the panelists mentioned, Southeast Asia 
is really a, a fragmentation of you know a, a lot of various markets with their own languages, data requirements, policies, regulations. So so like our colleagues, it's it's not you know sometimes it's different to what our colleagues in the U.S. and U.K. might think, where a lot of the the market requirements may be standardized in those regions, um, which makes it um, you know a, a challenge but really fun as well. So I think uh, what we've learned and maybe what we wish we had known earlier was. There is a lot of opportunity here. Um, you know, you never have a boring day because you'd be talking to a regulator in the Philippines one day, and you'll be trying to, you know, figure out how to make sure that your product is uh, supporting well. You know, the Malaysian government IDs and you know the the uh, uh, the requirements in that country another day. Um, but it, it, it is, is a lot of work um, and you really have to work hard and make sure that you understand each country's requirements and put in the effort to tweak the product and provide the, you know, tweak the product in a way that it fits that market's requirements is it's key to success. So what we've learned is sometimes, you know, as an example, we, we went into the Philippines um, three years ago, we had a major customer, but that said, you know, we hadn't really worked on our product um, fully to the extent which we probably should have. And so we learned our lesson and kind of, you know, uh, basically stepped back and then went back in again a year ago once we really could stand behind our product. So, so don't be afraid to, uh, you know, take time out and, and work on the product before before coming back to the market is, is one thing that we've learned. And, um, and and then, you know, we've been really positively surprised by how, how quickly the region is embracing digi digitization, how, how uh, forward thinking the regulators are in accepting new technologies and bringing them to market. Uh, but, but just not giving up and, and persisting <laughs> would be the main takeaway. Brilliant. Thank you. And yeah, I think that's kind of your point at the beginning about kind of the fragmentation of the market and the diversity, I think, is something that's come through in a, in a lot of the answers. But I love that your response to that is that it's fun <laughs> and it's a challenge. So that's a that seems like a great attitude to be going in with and, um, and not boring. Um, definitely not boring. It's, as a region, it's it's so dynamic and so much going on. And I definitely that's been my experience being here as well. Um, and great advice, I think, for businesses to really put in the time and effort in advance to understand what they're coming into and how their product fits into that and a bit of persistence and determination. Thank you. Um, that's that's brilliant. Sanjay, I'll come back to you next for your closing thoughts. Yep. So we are a very proud uh, UK business. Uh, we were founded in 2013, and I'm very proud of what we are doing globally, and we're very proud of what we're doing in the region of helping customers of ours protect themselves against clever, sophisticated attacks. Um, this region uh, represents opportunity. If I were to leave one thing behind, which I frankly was not a big believer myself sorry if i sound a bit uh, you know not not by script how we collaborated with the uk government uh, from day one and i started this business in asia pacific in 2015 and i myself didn't know what impact we can make together with working with the british embassy working with the dit and the various departments so once again i'm echoing my colleague uh, my 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 fellow panelist from wise do not underestimate this partnership and this collaboration. If you have a unique value proposition, uh, please you take advantage of a massive network and, and a genuine interest in helping UK businesses expand in the region. So with this, I will say thank you so much to everybody who has helped us. Uh, and uh, we continue to work with you uh, on, on, the, on the journey ahead. Brilliant. That's, um, that's so great to hear, both in terms of clearly how proud you are of what the company has been able to do to help people to protect themselves. Um, the passion about the opportunities in Southeast Asia, but also great to hear in terms of the support and the value that partnership with the UK government can add. I mean, that's definitely what we're aiming to do on the UK government side is um, promote that UK brand under our businesses trade, um, help people to network and find business partners in, in the region. Um, and, and work with as many businesses as possible to really sell the UK offer because it's a great business opportunity for UK businesses, but also I think UK businesses just have genuinely such a lot to offer this region as it develops. Um, so that's really a motivating agenda for me to be working on as well. Thank you. Um, Paris, let's come to you. Yeah, sure. So I think Avashi has um, summed up very nicely, likewise from Alien earlier, the challenges that I think any companies wishing to enter into the Southeast Asian market should be aware of. 
that would be the nuances. It's not like one whole region altogether that is actually different, even though it's Southeast Asia. So this is the expectation that you know businesses should have. And localization, yes, this is a point that I totally agree that at the end of the day, the customers will ask like, do you have a team here? So how much support can we get? Things like that. So I think enough um, due diligence, enough homework on the ground needs to be done. And the other key challenge that companies will face is the local talent, largely not spoken about, but it's a genuine fact that, you know, companies want to grow their business, they have to be cognizant of the challenge. So like for us, we have been successful in the countries which we operated because we place a lot of emphasis to get it right. Um, we know our business is in providing defense for businesses. We have to ensure we are there. We are able to provide the necessary support when they need. We cannot rest on our laurels. When you talk about compliance, it runs 24-7. It doesn't have off days. So this is something that um, BAE Systems pride, pride itself very strongly against. And this is where when we move into a market, we grow our business, we must be confident. And we are confident that we will be able to deliver to the customer's expectations. Brilliant. Thank you. Yeah. And again, this point is coming through really clearly, isn't it, about the nuance of the region and um, as well as the level of opportunity, just really being willing to do the homework and the due diligence, as you put it, uh, to make sure that you're really as well positioned as possible. Um, so thank you very much for that. And uh, last but by no means least, Eliane of WISE. Um, yeah. Let's get your final reflections. Yeah. So I think like everyone already mentioned everything that's important, but probably like a very practical advice and the reasons why I'm, I really agree with what Paris has mentioned. Like you need, if you want to expand here, I think it will be wise just to put your feet on the ground, like hire local people, because they are the one that can help you understand what is happening on the ground. And also for you to understand what's like the situation. And I think one reason for that is that because uh, Southeast Asia is a region, as also, um, and also as, a, as an Indonesian, we are very relationship based. Um, so a lot of stuff can only happen when you invest your efforts and time to build the relationships either with regulators, local partners, and so on. So there is a practical advice that WISE is also learning by, by expanding into this region. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, and you're right. And um, as Paris said as well, that localization point, the, point, the, the importance of being here, the important, importance of putting effort into finding and developing that local talent to being here to respond to local expectations of support and uh, build those relationships, which is so key across this whole region, as you say. I think sometimes in the UK, we can tend to be a bit more transactional, um, but that's not the way business is done in, uh, in Southeast Asia. So adapting to that is really, really key. Um, thank you all so much for agreeing to be on this panel and for sharing your thoughts and experience your, your wisdom so generously with everybody listening in. I've personally, you know, I'm not a particularly a tech sector expert. I found it absolutely fascinating um, and really learned a lot. And I already was very excited about the opportunities for the uh, tech sector in Southeast Asia and particularly in our three markets of focus today, Malaysia, um, Vietnam and Indonesia. But I've come away even more excited about it. I think it's, you know, it's just been absolutely clear that Southeast Asia represents really vast potential for fintech and for cyber cybersecurity as well. And, um, you know, we, we've covered some of this, but the, the region has a combined population of 580 million people. And it's a population that is young, that is tech savvy, that is increasingly now benefiting from deep mobile internet penetration um, and, and also increasingly, I think, strong government support for the development of digital sectors and for innovation and, um, and, and new products. So that, that all adds up to a lot of opportunity. And then you've also got the fact that it's a, it's a, a large proportion of that huge population um, are unbanked. So as well as those that are already banked, but are looking to really enhance their experience and adopt the latest technologies, you've also got a financial inclusion element that these new technologies are enabling a whole uh, different segments of the population to access services for the first time, which is really exciting. 
And um, so I think all of these countries, it's been very clear from this discussion, are emerging as really promising locations for fintech um, companies to thrive. And as I was touching on before, to thrive themselves as businesses, but also to really service a, a growing population here that are open to new forms of financial services and technology and to support the development of these sectors in these countries and help to shape them for the future. So a really huge thanks to our panelists once again for your insightful sharing today. And I'm sure or I really, really hope that this will encourage more UK tech businesses, many of which are hopefully dialed in today to enter these these really up and coming markets and support them as well in their preparation for this and make sure that they are also they have their eyes open to some of the challenges and some of the ways in which they can um, learn from the experiences we've heard about today and, and best prepare themselves. So I highly encourage companies participating today to consider Southeast Asia um, and to please do get in touch with us at DIT, the Department for International Trade, if we can help you in any way with your next steps on your own business journey. We are a resource in, in market that is here for you to utilize, to tap into, um, to help you to access these exciting markets. So I believe we put in the chat box two links that will help you in terms of getting in touch with us so that you know how to do that. So do reach out and we'd be very happy to talk to you about um, the types of support that we can provide, introductions within the market, overviews, um, connections, and, and so forth to help you get started. I think there is an enormous potential for you in this market, an enormous amount of value that you could add as these markets really take off. Um, that will, that's it there for the panel discussion. So we will wrap up this part of the webinar there. And I will now give the stage back to Mercedes to wrap up. So I wish you all the very best of health and success. Thank you for joining us for this discussion and look forward to being in touch with some of you in the future. Can you see and hear me okay? We can. Fantastic. Okay, well, I think, Emily, you summarised the whole panel discussion, the whole session really, really well there. I don't have an awful lot to add aside from just a few reflections from, from my side. So as you can see on the screen there, my name is Mercedes White. I am one of the new Digital Trade Network leads here in the region. Um, really, we're here to support and help and drive UK tech business across the region. And it's great to hear uh, on the call that there has already been really positive experience working with, with DIT. I think um, it's really, really interesting to hear right from the very start how, how many initiatives there are across the region um, from governments to drive and support fintech and cybersecurity and, and indeed tech, tech business um, to enter. And that's from standards right through to sandboxes. Um, so that's, that's really great to see that there are progressive policies coming through. I think the second reflection for me would just be around the enormous variety of opportunities that there are in the region. Um, and I, I think it's, it's such an exciting time to, to enter these markets. I mean, Indonesia's digital economy, for example, is set to grow, I think, by eight times by 2030. So we're looking at enormous digital transformation over the next decade. So it's a really exciting time to, to enter. I think, um, as, as Chris Bush actually mentioned at the start, um, the Digital Trade Network is a new, a, a new initiative and we're here to support. And uh, I think I'll end on that really positive note. Thank you all so, so much for joining us. Thank you to UK ABC for helping to facilitate the session. Thank you to our wonderful 
panel members today. Thank you, Emily, for doing an excellent job moderating. And thank you all to our attendees for joining us today. And please get in touch and look forward to hearing from you. And best of luck to everyone on your journeys. Thank you.